Hi students, we're here to talk about the Aegean today. Much of what we know about this region comes from the poet Homer, who had written down tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey by about the 8th century BC. There is a rich trove of archaeology that often actually supports the evidence of these stories or some parts of these stories potentially having been true. And it's interesting, the region, because we're looking at uh, ancient Greece and ancient Anatolia, modern day Turkey, and just this large region tied together by these mythical and mythological stories. Here we have a map of the Bronze Age Aegean. You can see the cities of Mycenae, Athens, Troy, we'll be talking about Knossos as well, and the Cycladic Islands there in the middle. So beginning with Cycladic art, this was a pre-literate society trading in obsidian. We talked about already when a region has something to trade, whether it's pottery or something like this volcanic stone that could be fashioned into incredibly sharp tools. When a society has those things to offer, they're often finding themselves very wealthy because what they have is desired far and wide. We also see in the Cycladic Islands something called cyst graves. So we've seen all sorts of different ways of treating the dead in these last couple classes that we've been talking about, these, the development of civilization and early people. And in this case, the cyst graves are stone pits lined with stone slabs. Now because these people left no writing, there's much that still remains a mystery. And in particular, these items that we're looking at here and here are a mystery. We call them frying pan vessels, but we're not entirely sure what they were used for. Um, we found these in the thousands. They are about 20 centimeters in diameter, most of them, some bigger, some smaller. And they're generally highly ornamented, highly decorated. Some potential uses of these, and again, we are taking guesses, educated guesses, as archaeologists and our historians, possibly a plate, some sort of cooking utensil, a mirror, a drum, some sort of religious object, a libation vessel, which is something that ritual offerings might be poured over. Also found in these graves were these small figurines or little idols or fetishes, they're sometimes called. They range from just a couple inches high, two, three inches, to some of them two, three feet high. Most of them can't stand on their own. Here we see what we believe are the female figures. You can see the accentuated triangle and the breasts. See the range in size in these figures. So thinking about what they were used for, again, we are taking educated guesses. Some possible uses were idols. This is a term I'd like you to please get in your notes. This is an image, a representation of God used in some sort of worship. Funerary surrogates for human sacrifice. As civilizations evolved and human sacrifice was thankfully started to see as something that was a little bit untoward to do, um, sometimes we would see little figures like this offered instead possibly used in a household shrine. There are on many of them signs of repair, so something that a family would have had potentially through generations. Play or decoration could be that simple. Sometimes we find that we overanalyze things like this, and these are just children's toys, or some sort of spirit statue. When you think about the Egyptians, some sort of Ka statue or other sort of uh, celebration of somebody that's passed or some sort of ritual. The male figures are generally seen with instruments, which is interesting, the juxtaposition between the female and the male, and there are significantly less of this type. So moving to a slightly different region of the Aegean, we're talking about Minoan Crete. This is a 124-mile long island oriented east to west. They did have a writing system called Linear A, and unfortunately, little survives from this civilization because there were two earthquakes in first in 1700, the second in 1450. And although much was rebuilt, by the time that second earthquake hit, the civilization didn't fully recover. I mentioned 
that we would be meeting some archaeologists. So here is Sir Arthur John Evans. Please make sure to have his name down in your book. He was a Minoan Crete archaeologist in the 1920s. And what he did there is, I'm going to say it's good and bad. He really wanted to restore the palace at Knossos in order to have it be some place that could be visited. And he rebuilt a lot of what was there with modern technology, things like cement that was not originally used. And he kind of just guessed if things were in such disarray. And of course, he's using labor that is maybe not familiar with the building practices necessary. They did the best they could. They tried to do what they thought was right, but they really made a total mess of the site. So here is a plan of the palace complex at Knossos in Crete. And you can see there are so many little rooms and connecting hallways here. Um, we, as a modern culture, Sir Arthur Evans was a British man and he came to Knossos um, imagining that civilization was similar to what he was familiar with in a monarchy. So you see terms like the throne room or the queen's hall, and these were likely not accurate. We really don't know enough about this civilization uh, to really know how or why or what these rooms were used for, but it was irresistible for him to kind of compare what he was familiar with in a monarchy to what he was discovering here. But what I do want you to observe is just the vast, complex, incredibly intricate building that we're looking at here for these early civilizations. We often see flat topped roofs when we look back through time. This was certainly a easier building technique, but it also meant that buildings could be added onto and you can see all the different tiers of these buildings potentially growing in stories over periods of years. In this one wall here, Evans had tried to show construction techniques of the Minoans. And you can see in the background between the columns a fresco. And we'll talk about frescoes and mosaics in the next couple of slides. So this is an example of one of those times that Arthur Evans does something kind of silly. Um, this is a room that they were calling the Queen's Megaron. And you can see the incredible mosaic on the wall. So that is a mosaic of dolphins with little fish swimming. You can see how natural it is. So looking at the seaweed on top and kind of just the loose, fun, playful manner of the image. This originally was located on the floor and these buildings were in such disarray, crumbled and had to be reconstructed um, often from scratch. And Evans just kind of stuck that where he thought it made sense. Please get this term down, fresco. I'm going to have a link to a short video for you to watch in the uh, details below the video. So fresco is when vibrant mineral colors are applied to wet or dry plaster. So when we talk about the term bon fresco, that means true fresco. That's when paint or pigment is applied to wet plaster. Uh, there is a less stable or less long lasting technique of applying pigment to dry plaster. Minoan art generally is showing imagery of nature and animals in nature. You can see here these tufted grasses. There are lilies kind of sprouting out the top of these little hills and these two little lovebirds giving each other a kiss or sharing a snack. This is a small portion of an unfortunately quite deteriorated, very large fresco we call the ship fresco. And we believe this is some sort of boating celebration or regalia. Just looking at this little piece of the larger image, you can see all the way on top, the deer jumping. Um, you have the hillsides and these homes built directly into the hillsides people standing on top of the buildings and on the shore, watching the ships, waiting for the ships to leave or come back. In some of the other images, there's strings of lights uh, and garland spread about the ships. 
in obvious celebration of something. The Minoans were very well known for their pottery. It was inspired by nature, as most of their art was, and importantly manufactured on potter's wheels. So this invention of a pottery wheel allows people making the pottery to work quicker, to produce larger and more significant vessels. When we look at the imagery of these vessels, the Minoan pottery, we will often see octopuses and other sea life on them. And they really used the um, the form to accentuate whatever creature or patterns that they were applying on it. Uh, these vessels themselves, they would be used for storing anything you can imagine, things like grain, oil, wine. This wide-eyed octopus is swirling its tentacles everywhere. There's clumps of algae floating. It's dynamic and naturalistic. And the belly of the vessel really is being accentuated by the positioning of the octopus. This is the snake goddess from the palace complex at Knossos. She's made out of what is called faience, which is the form herself is formed out of pottery. And then there's tin, almost like glazing, put on it when it is fired a second time. I want you to notice the cat on top of this little lady's head and the snakes in her hands. She was not like that when they found her. Here she is on the right hand side. You can see she's missing her head, one of her arms, and appears to have something in her right hand. So what he did was kind of just build on his ideas of what these people would have been. So like we were talking about with Arthur Evans creating this idea of the queen and the Megaron and the throne room and all that. Uh, here he found a headless statue with a squiggly something in one hand and this idea that these people potentially venerated cats and he kind of embellished this uh, this little statue here. It's uncertain what happened to the people in Minoan Crete, but we do believe that the weakening of the two volcanoes did not help. By 1450, invaders from the Greek mainland took over and they were there until about 1375. Um, and during that last eruption, the buildings and complexes were destroyed and abandoned. During the Greek occupation, the they painted in the style of the Minoans still. And you can see in this image below, this is called the Toreador fresco, meaning the bull fresco. And there are three young men. We believe this is some sort of rite of passage or ritual. And again, because they didn't leave writings about this in particular, these are guesses we are making. We're talking about a civilization that lived 3000 years ago. So they believe that this is some sort of jumping the bull ritual in order to come into manhood. Mycenae is in mainland Greece, and we have a world-famous archaeologist named Heinrich Schlielman that studied there. He was certain that the events of the Greek myths to do with the Trojan War written down by Homer were true, and he was on a mission to uncover what he could. So he initially excavated at Troy, where the Trojan War is to have taken place, <coughs> Excuse me, and later at Mycenae on mainland Greece. In excavating this wall further, and directly by the side of the palace of King Priam, I came upon a large copper article of the most remarkable form, which attracted my attention all the more as I thought I saw gold behind it. In order to withdraw the treasure from the greed of my workmen, and to save it for archaeology, I immediately call, had Phaedos called, lunch break called. While the men were eating and resting, I cut out the treasure with a large knife. It would, however, have been impossible for me to have removed the treasure without the help of my dear wife, who stood by me ready to pack the things which I cut out in her shawl and to carry them away. And here is Heinrich Schlimmann's wife wearing some of these fineries that they had found. Three terms for you here to please get down in your notes. A megaron, meaning palace or large room in ancient Greek. Citadel, which is the fortified area of a town atop a hillside. Portico, porch-like entrance, covered and often supported by columns. In looking at this fresco, we can see hints of Egyptian influence. So if you think about the Egyptian composite pose, face to the right, shoulders frontal, this 
character here has a slight smile on her lips, something we call the archaic smile. We saw that also in ancient Greece, we'll continue, or sorry, in ancient Egypt, we'll continue to see that as we dive into ancient Greece next week. She's holding a necklace, we think, um, but it also has a hint of that snake goddess holding those snakes we saw earlier. We met linear A language already. Here is linear B. Uh, it's slightly differentiated, but derived from Minoan's linear A. And much of the writing has to do with just accounts of inventories. So taking inventories, who was owed money, um, how many sheep are in the field that week. Eventually, this becomes and develops into ancient Greek language. People lived in small stone houses below the citadel, so below that fortified area. The walls of the citadel themselves were, in some areas, up to 20 feet thick. Uh, the tunnel, there were tunnels inside of the city that led to water sources, and this meant that if they were under siege or being attacked, that they would have access to water and wouldn't be starved out. In this reconstruction of the citadel at Mycenae, you can see the thick walls, the uh, complex buildings, the government buildings here, burial site, which we'll see a little while later, the roads. And here is the main gateway entrance. This is called the Lion's Gate. It was built in about 1250 BCE. A couple terms to please get down, which we'll carry forward. Cyclopean masonry, so the Cyclops were a mythological race of giants who were believed to be strong enough to lift these blocks of stone. It was unimaginable that humans could create something like this. Corbeling. Uh, corbeling is arranging layers of stone that are called courses. Each layer projects slightly beyond the lower layer, so you can see right above that center of the doorway how those corbels come out a little further and a little further to make the triangle. And in that triangle is something called a relieving triangle. This is a ar architectural component that's often used in arches to take pressure off the corbeling. So rather than the stones having all this downward pressure, it helps to push a little bit of pressure back out into the stones themselves. Although tholoses or round buildings were not uncommon, this one in particular is an exceptional example of this building style. We call this the treasury of Arteris, even though we can't imagine that this was actually his treasury. Again, we're kind of assigning these um, story ideas onto the realities of the time. There are about 900 of these buildings. This one in particular is 40 feet high and wide. And the roadway that we're standing inside of uh, for this picture to be taken is called a dromos. This dromos is 118 feet long. And once whatever was placed inside, uh, once that was done, the goods were sealed inside, burial was sealed inside. This whole dromos would be filled again with rubble and stone in order to um, dissuade people from looting. So another couple terms here, we have facade. You can think of that as the front face of the building or the entryway of something. We have corbelled vaulting and you see that relieving triangle that's also applied here. So here is an image of the inside. You can see it's very dark, but it's incredibly well intact for being how old it is. It's a very large room, um, probably at that point the largest dome that had been created. So as I said, 40 feet wide, 40 feet high. It's incredibly impressive. In this modern aerial view of Mycenae, you can see in the, kind of the center bottom of the slide, there is a little round area. And here's a reconstruction of that area. This is where there were extensive pit graves, so these deep graves found straight down into um, the hillside here. And they were not just single graves, so multiple different burials were found together. Most famously is the mask of Agamemnon. And again, we don't believe this was Agamemnon's mask. There were several dozen of these incredible hammered masks found. One of the things that is interesting about them is that these beaten gold masks are all stylized, so they're kind of, they represent a, a look or an aesthetic that would have been a period of art, a movement of art. People don't really, really perfectly look like this. They're not trying to represent 
humans perfectly. You can see kind of those um, coffee bean eyes that are there. But what's interesting is that these are portraits. Even though this is a death mask mm -hmm. of a certain person, we're relatively sure this represents an actual person. So somebody with kind of a pointy nose, this big uh, bushy beard and mustache, ears that stuck out significantly. Other riches that were found in the graves are innumerable. This sword in particular that was inlaid with gold, silver. There's four hunters armed, a fifth is dead. There's a lion running away. The dagger, the idea that somebody would have lions being conquered on their dagger means that whoever would have wielded this would have been a warrior of great power potentially. We'll move from here relatively seamlessly into our next week's lecture talking about the ancient Greek world. Hope you have a great week.